Okay, welcome everybody to our December 2nd rounds with uh, Lindsay Stevanato, who uh, recently just moved into the Perry Sound area with her business. I'll let you take over, Lindsay. Okay, thanks, Kathy, and thank you for coming today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about what the impact has been, what we have seen um, in our practice with the impact of the pandemic on the on children's development. Uh, it's been an interesting time and we all know and it's been a struggle for everyone. Um, I'm just going to first uh, disclose any affiliation. So I am owner operator of a private for profit children's therapy clinic. It's called Lindsay Stevanato Children's Therapy Services. Um, I am re receiving an honorarium for this presentation. A um, little bit about uh, myself and where it all began. Um, I have been in the practice for about 36 years. Uh, I graduated at U of T and moved up north Sudbury area uh, to work in a children's therapy um, center there got to know the kind of practice I would like to be involved in in my career. It was a multidisciplinary team and um, we really worked well together. We even had a school attached to the center. Um, so in I, I did work in publicly funded agencies uh, until 2001. So in Barrie, I opened up a clinic and at the first, and that was 2001. So I've been in, in a private practice for 22, almost 22 years in January. Uh, started as an occupational therapist only center. And then um, with the parents prodding, added more and more services to the clinic. So started with OT, added speech and language services, added physiotherapy services, then um, psychotherapy and social work and psychology. So um, we have all of those under the one roof and that's very attractive for a lot of parents and caregivers. So then um, I originally was from Perry Sound. I've been away for 40 years and uh, knew the need was here also in Perry Sound. So we opened up a satellite clinic um, here in November, or sorry, in March, 2022. And um, we've been doing an awful lot of work in the indigenous schools here, uh, but also in our own clinic, which is located at 72 Church Street. Um, this, uh, I'm going to just move it to the next slide, just so you know, the comparison between publicly funded services and private fun uh, funded services, you may know this already. Um, a lot of the reasons are around the public is the reason why I went private. Um, the first thing that pops out right away is wait list, which I'm sure you've all experienced, all struggled with. Um, Publicly, service, public, publicly funded services for children's therapy is approximately two to three year wait list. They might get an intake uh, completed, but then the actual looking at the child, doing a consultation is about a two to three year wait list. With a private service, there is no wait list. Our goal anyways is to make sure the child is booked two to three weeks after they have made the call. Um, I will say though, psychology services, we do have a wait list. It's very uh, limited with the resources and it is a huge demand. Um, publicly funded services typically have a consultative model. So they are giving their ideas, their, their strategies to either the caregiver, to a teacher, um, they sometimes do not work directly with the child doing therapy treatment. In private, we do a hands-on model where we do actually treat the child. Um, we work with the family. Um, in the publicly funded, often lacks that involvement with the child. At times, you're just consulting to a teacher or you're just consulting to the caregiver. So the, the child sometimes is not even involved. The caregiver may or may not be involved, especially if the services exist in the school. 
Whereas in private, we are a family-centered approach. So we do involve everyone that's involved with the child. Uh, extended family sometimes, uh, we bring in the teacher. Uh, so we try to work as a unit and a multidisciplinary team. Um, I will say that as well in the public, I don't have that down here, but also public services. It seems that we're all kind of working in the silo. So we're not able to really work together and have a nice approach to the, a nice multidisciplinary approach. Um, publicly funded services also have a, a bit of a generic um, way of looking at strategies. So a strategy that may be used on one child, may be used on another and another without really looking at the individual needs. So that is something a private service does. It, it assesses the child individually, looks at um, what their strengths, weaknesses are, and makes a treatment plan, and then actually carries on the treatment. Um, publicly, you may find that there's not a buy-in from the caregiver uh, for a number of reasons. They may not be present when the, when the intervention happens. Also, they may not be putting any, well, a lot of them do not pay for the service. So sometimes if there isn't a payment, they may not be as engaged. Um, whereas private caregivers are absolutely invested because often they're paying for it and they want the best out of that. And also they have to come to the appointment with the child. So we do engage them, uh, whether they like it or not sometimes, but um, we, we, we like that approach. Um, and of course, the downfall is uh, in the public service, they're not, there's no fee at all, whereas we, we do have to charge a fee. So some of the ways to get um, this covered, the caregiver can pay out of pocket, and that happens, but there are funding agencies that can take the, the, the cost away from the parent. Those some uh, are called Jordan's Principle, which you may be aware of uh, in, with the Indigenous population. Uh, the OAP funding for parents with children with autism. There's Easter Seals. There's Family Connections. Um, those are all agencies that have taken on, Social Services is another one, that have taken on um, uh, being a funding agent for the child, as well as insurance. So if the the parent has benefits, then we put it through insurance. So there is a way around that. Okay, just going, any questions about that so far? We'll move on to the next slide. I will take questions throughout. So just so you know, it's pretty informal. So if there is anything you might want to ask me, feel free. Um, Kathy, I know is looking at the chat. <laughs> I'm gonna look at it right now before, Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so the next slide is about um, the influencing factors of child development. We make sure we talk about all of these things when a child comes through the door. We know that this does have an influence on how the child develop, develop. So we wanna make sure we've um, really made sure that we've asked and, and looked at where these are in a child's life. So the first three actually are ones we can't do a lot about. So genetics, uh, but we do want to know if there's anything, um, any history there that we need to know. Diagnosis, so has any diagnosis be, had, has been made so far? Often we are the first stop and um, we are the ones that kind of pick up some red flags and encourage them to get the investigation done through family doctor to pediatrician to psycho or, uh, psychiatrist, wherever we need to send them. Then trauma, any accidents, injuries, surgeries that may impact um, the development. Uh, but the last five, we spend a lot of time on because we know they make a huge difference. So I will just chat a little bit about um, about parenting skills. So this has been huh, a huge influence, I think, for the last little while. It seems like a lot of our therapy wraps around coaching parents. So the first thing we want to look at is their consistency in the home. 
Um, are things being followed the same? Maybe it's a broken home and we wanna make sure there's consistency between the two homes that the child is involved with. Is there follow through um, for demands made, discipline? Is, is, are there things happening as a consequence? Are there clear boundaries? Does the child know um, what is expected of them? And we wanna make sure there's a schedule or routine within the home. Uh, are things kind of as they come or do, is there a set plan? And the last thing we really wanna look at is the child caregiver relationship. How is that doing? And, uh, and that makes a huge impact too. So those are the parenting skills uh, we dive into and we want to know how things are functioning there. The eating is another big area, is how are they eating? Are they getting a good variety of foods? Are they eliminating some foods in their diet? Uh, why are they doing that? Uh, sometimes uh, in the autistic population, they may only want a certain color of food for a while, and then that might change. But we wanna know if there's anything happening in that area. Um, and why? Are there sensory challenges? Are there some foods that really bother them in their mouth with textures? And um, we want to know oral motor wise, can they even coordinate their tongue, lip and jaw to actually uh, eat the food? Is there certain foods they're avoiding because of that? Uh, some kids uh, won't eat meat because it's very fatiguing and it's hard to manipulate in their mouth. Um, some kids are food stuffers because they don't understand or they don't feel the food in their mouth so well. So they stuff the whole cavity up so they have a better idea of where that food is in their mouth. So we look at all these interesting things. Um, we want to look at the, how the family models um, eating. Do they have family meals? Can that child even sit for the whole meal? That's another area. Um, eating disorders. Definitely, we want to look, is there any, any uh, things going on in this area? So that is our eating. Then we look at sleeping. So there are some guidelines out there from the Pediatric Society, and we try to follow those and, and see if they're, they're making the mark. So for their age, we want to take that into consideration, but it's anywhere from 10 to 12 hours of sleep a night that we're looking for. Is that happening? Do they have trouble falling asleep? Do they have trouble with nighttime awakenings, getting up in the night? And then their sleep hygiene. So how does it look an hour before bed? Are they winding down? Do they have things in place for them to kind of get them in the mood for sleeping? So we take all of that into consideration and in seeing how that's functioning. Um, then we go into physical activity. We're benchmark, our benchmark there is an hour a day of physical activity. So we wanna make sure that child is getting that per day. So if they're not, why not? And what's happening underneath that? We want to uncover as much as we can. Then, the, the hardest one and the one that uh, seems to be such a difficult area for parents and caregivers um, is screen time. This has really been all over the map during the pandemic too, but we also want to go back to our guidelines and we want to see how is that functioning. So from zero to two years of age, we want uh, no screen time if possible and only video chats happening from zero to two. Two to five, the, the benchmark is an hour a day. And elementary school age children, it's two hours a day. Recently, the Canadian Pediatric Society has relaxed this somewhat to um, take into consideration the educational programs that are out there. They emphasize more decreasing passive screen time and more uh, want to emphasize co-viewing with the child. So you're there modeling the desired um, behavior. So maybe after a time you're going, wow, that's a lot, let's turn it off. You wanna be there to, to model what you want to see in, in your own child. If the goals tend to be unrealistic, the caregivers just ignore them and the children ignore them. Um, so we want them to be more realistic and, and attainable for the family. 
Possibly we look at screen-free time in the, in the home. Maybe there's a time that everything's shut off. Maybe there's screen-free rooms in the house that when you're in them, there's no screens. Uh, the big thing we look for is there one-to-one -one, um, interaction with the caregiver. Is that happening? Uh, so those are everything we take into consideration. Any questions up to this point around that? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Okay. And we'll have time at the end for sure to, to work with that. Okay. So we have definitely seen lots of changes through the pandemic. And I, I know we're not actually through the pandemic, but we've, uh, we've uh, progressed. And um, the first three, really no change or nothing we can we can have uh, much impact on is the genetics diagnoses and trauma. Um, I haven't seen any studies, but I can, I can hypothesize that for trauma, it might have reduced actually during the pandemic due to our, uh, us being in a bubble. Um, so the things that we did see that we can impact are the, th the five um, listed there. So I'm gonna go a bit into depth um, in each of these ones as well. So parenting, what happened? So the lack of schedule and routine usually was, was heavily impacted here. Why? Because a lot, was, a, a lot of us were in the home together. So we were working, um, we were in the home with the children, trying to do online learning with them, being online with our work, that was a big, big challenge for families in the home. Also, parents and caregivers own mental health. How are they doing? Just getting by, a lot of them said to us, is, is they were just surviving. And um, because of that, uh, they, the, a lot of things got lax in the home. So instead of dealing with the boundaries um, and rules, a lot of that was gone out the, the window just because of their energy level, the things they had to do. So those became quite lax. And for the parent themselves, they really um, had no social contact. So then their, so, their support networks weren't there for them. Um, and people were getting sick of online. So meeting our friends online after being online all day, uh, they actually for, you know, a lot of them didn't uh, continue with that. So then those support net networks weren't there for them. Um, the other thing we did see was a rise in abuse, unfortunately, is um, some of these children, the school was their safe place. And uh, we did see this, this uh, increase. One positive thing, I know it sounds all doom and gloom, um, but there was something positive that came out is that parents became more aware of their children's abilities. So sometimes the school would notice something happening, parents didn't notice it so much, so they didn't make it a priority to attend to. With online learning, with having their child at home all the time, this they did see it and they became more aware and they got the help they needed. So that was a real plus. So that's a, a good thing. Um, in eating, uh, again, and this is gonna be a constant theme, is the lack of schedule. So because people were all working different hours and attending to things, um, it started to have, have everyone kind of on different eating schedules maybe going to different areas of the room um, and eating there instead of eating at the table together as a family. So we did see a, a little bit of a dip there for family meals. That also can't, was a plus for some families that they were home and they did more family meals, but I would say we saw a real reduction in this. Um, again, a rule in the home that just got, um, that got ignored. Um, as I said, uh, we, we do look at eating disorders too. So those eating disorders, uh, some of them began to increase uh, because of the stressors out there, the food insecurity, 
disruption in schedule routine, those are real uh, factors to eating disorders. So we saw a rise in that. And um, also, unfortunately, during the pandemic, um, there was less resources out there to access. And that might have exacerbated some of these, um, the difficulties that we saw in that group. As well, and I think I can report, I this happened to me too, more snacking. <laughs> it was available, uh, the food was right there. It was an easy thing to get off the computer, walk around, have a snack. So again, there's the uh, potential for a weight increase there. And we did see that with some of our, ch some of our children too. Okay, in sleeping, any questions too, just please interrupt. Um, what happened with sleeping? And again, I will say lack of routine <laughs> is uh, we ended up seeing later nights, later mornings too, when they, they are rising. I wanted to look a little bit into some research just to see if this was the same as what we're seeing and anything that supported it. Many of the site, the studies were a caregiver's questionnaire. So it's their report that's happened here. Um, but one of the studies I was looking at, this was uh, kids going to bed after 10 p.m. at night. During the pandemic, 23 preschoolers were going to bed after 10 p.m. compared to 7% pre-COVID. 46% of school-age kids compared to 9% pre-COVID. And 90% of adolescents compared to 57% uh, pre-COVID were going to bed after 10 p.m. Then we looked at waking after 8 a.m. and we saw that in the preschool population, 42% were waking after 8 a.m. compared to 20, or sorry, compared to 12% pre-COVID. School age was 63% compared to 5% pre-COVID and 81 adolescents um, compared to 10% pre-COVID were waking up after 8 a.m. Um, we also saw difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Some of those factors were anxiety and not physically tired enough, actually. The Journal of Sleep Research pointed out that parent stress ident was identified as a substantial risk uh, factor for lower sleep quality in the child. So that impacted the child. Okay, going on to physical activity. As I noted just ahead, that they weren't physically tired enough because they weren't meeting that hour a day um, benchmark that we had and our goal. Uh, often when I ask parents, like they just, they had so much other things to deal with, they weren't getting the child outside. Um, and also organized sports were discontinued. No gym classes were happening. So the increase in sedentary behavior definitely sunk in. Um, they lacked outside time just because of parents' work schedules, uh, less moving. Um, so if you're moving less, there's a, a risk of weight increase, mood disorders, sleep issues, gross motor development, um, and then self-confidence because their skill isn't there, their self-confidence isn't there. So when they're moving less, they have less gross motor skill and then less confidence to get out there and do some different things too. Okay, and screen time. So what happened? I think we all know what happened. There was an increase, uh, increase in use both uh, with online education um, and or online learning and pleasure. The, there was a big increase in screen addiction. Um, more screens went into the bedroom than ever before, which would disturb sleep. So when you have so much of that blue light exposure, that does causes a disruption in melatonin production, which to get sleepy, our melatonin level has to be up a certain therapeutic level. And when that doesn't happen, we do have a hard time falling asleep. Um, cyber victimization was there, of course, and other online challenges for the, for the child. 
So those are those are the things that have um, that we've really uh, noticed in the last couple of years. We're almost at three years. I can't believe it. Um, with all of that bundled up into one big thing, we did see the biggest impact. So with all those changes, with parenting, with um, sleeping, eating, physical activity, screen time, they all lent itself to um, a big impact on a child's anxiety and their behavior. Any questions up to this point? Because I'm going to dive into both of those. We're all good? Okay. All right. First one, anxiety. So what did we see? So with anxiety, we saw the four uh, different types really escalate. So social anxiety, and that makes sense. They really weren't being social with their peers. They, that was very limited. So weren't getting that skill honed. And I would say we want to really take into consideration where that child was developmentally pre-COVID. So the real little ones, um, you know, going into JK, let's say, that's where you develop so much of these social skills. And if that wasn't happening and they just had their family, then uh, social anxiety was on the rise. Once the doors were open to the schools again, many of them were getting um, quite anxious socially. And then performance anxiety. In for two years, they were really measured against themselves. Um, they weren't really a, a, a aware of all the other people and the comparisons. Once the schools got back in, all of a sudden they're being compared to their peers and their uh, uh, all the kids in their classroom. So that anxiety rose. Just fear with certain things, uh, certain fears. So germs, of course, was a biggie that our social workers and our psychotherapists are working with, especially fear of going out the door. Those were all on the rise. And then separation anxiety. So many of these uh, kids enjoyed being with their parents, felt safe there. Um, they only did things as a family. And then all of a sudden, they're having to go and separate from them and be in a, a, another environment for most of the day. So that was also on the rise. Um, we, in citing another study, we did, and I know most people know this, but the mental health concerns rose 74% in children. And there was a study out of the, U, out of the UK um, cited that kids reported boredom 74% of the time, loneliness, 65% of the time, and frustration, 61% of the time. Um, so a huge impact here. And some of, the, uh, some of these reports also say that having siblings or pets helped tend to reduce the impact. So that was some good news there too. Okay, so that's the anxiety piece. And then we go to behavior. So what were we seeing? And I will preface this by saying, this is my belief anyways. I believe a child does not want to be bad and they don't really want to misbehave. They don't wake up saying, huh, I'm gonna just make everyone's life miserable today. I personally do not believe that. I believe it's rooted rather in a lack of skill. So when a child is asked to do something that is above their skill level, they are going to be quite frustrated with that. And a lot of them uh, behave to get out of that challenge. So when they're challenged, their frustration really increases and many of them withdraw. They just sort of, they're quiet, they're reserved, they get back out of the picture. Others act out and they're very loud and you cannot not um, see what's happening there. Um, and they have to be removed sometimes, but that is a, a symptom of what's happening. They're, they're, they have a skill that they need to um, develop to feel that they can handle this challenge. So 
that is, I feel, is what we're dealing with a lot of a lot of the time. So the first, we want to look at all those skills. So one we did see that really had an impact was their sensory processing skills. Um, this is a bit of an OT term, but I'm just going to explain it a little bit. Is um, everyone, all of us, have all the sensory input coming into us all day long. We can filter what we want to attend to and what we don't want to attend to. Um, we can do that to help with our focus and attention. Somebody who's struggling with sensory processing, that isn't happening. So everything's coming in, they're bombarded by all the sensory input, they get overwhelmed, and what do they do? They react, and their behavior escalates. Um, so during COVID, there was a lot of reduction to exposure of certain sensory stimulation. And what happens when that's reduced, we see an increase in sensitivity. Um, most people think of sensory by, okay, eating, uh, tasting, touching, um, sense of smell. Those are all definitely sensory systems, but we also look at the vestibular system. So the child's sense of movement, how do they feel when they're being moved in space? So that's the vestibular system. We also look at the proprioceptive system. This is how does that child know their body in space? Do they understand where, um, like if their eyes were closed and their hands were up, do they realize their palms are facing up? Uh, they don't have a good sense if they have some difficulties with motor, uh, with proprioception, which is how they can plan their motor movements to do what they want it to do. So that's just a little tiny snippet of what sensory integration is, but we did see that reduction in exposure. So then we saw an increase in sensitivity for some of these kids, which resulted into poor behavior. Um, some kids, for example, who are tactile defensive and they're going into a large crowd, get very anxious and they may behave badly to get out of that situation because they don't know what how people are gonna touch them. Are people gonna rub up against them? Um, it's unpredictable touch. So they tend to over uh, exaggerate that and their behavior escalates. So that was, that's just something around the sensory processing. Self-regulation skills also became quite poor. Um, some of that was because of peer role modeling, which is our next point there. They didn't see their peers. How do they handle frustration? How, do, how does my parents handle frustration? Um, they have to be modeled that and it has to be taught is how best to handle that. Um, some self-regulation skills are very, very much impacted by their ability to problem solve. So when they're met with a challenge, can they look at that challenge and not all of a sudden say, I can't do it. Um, but can they look at that challenge and go, oh, there might be three ways I can solve this problem and they work it out themselves. So those are, that's strong problem solving skills. One thing I deal with a lot with parents is they like to swoop in, fix the problem for the child, swoop out, and then that child never develops that, that problem solving skill. So that's one thing we did find in COVID, especially with online learning, parents did do a lot of the problem solving for the child. So that problem solving was not really developed as a skill. So therefore, self-regulation skills plummeted. Um, and we had an awful lot of those uh, referrals that came in. Um, they often asked for help faster too. They didn't take the time to kind of look at the situation and uh, wanted help right away. Um, so as well as just self-regulation, there are other skills that we saw um, not being fostered and not developing. As I mentioned, problem solving, but also just learning skills. Um, and communication skills, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, social skills, and then emotional regulation skills. Those were all um, needing to be developed to then have the child act appropriately 
um, if they encountered this challenge. Okay, hopefully I made myself clear there. Uh, any questions? I feel like I've just talked a whole lot. Any questions up to this point? Nothing in the chat box yet. Okay, still good. All right. So next one, how do our therapy services, like how are they helping these kids? Um, I wanted to just give a good idea of all our different disciplines um, and what they do for each of these kind of problem areas we've just discussed. So currently we, in Perry Sound, we have occupational therapy, we have physiotherapy, we have speech and language pathology and uh, psychotherapy and psychology services. So let's look at occupational therapy because a lot of people don't understand uh, occupational therapy. And I will say it's a bit of a misnomer, especially when you're talking about children. So children, we want to look at their occupation. So their occupation is to play and also to go to school. Um, those are the two main things that they, that's what they're up to. So an occupational therapist looks at what their role is in society and how to foster that and um, make them more functional in their own environment. Uh, one of the big areas is the sensory processing, which we mentioned. Usually it's just occupational therapists who look at this. Um, we look at are there tools that we can use to help their sensory processing? So some children who have a very poor proprioception, um, for example, riding a bike. I'm just gonna give that example. So the child knows that they wanna go over and see that bike and they wanna get on it and ride it. So that's the first part, that's the ideation part of it. The middle part of it, is like, okay, I know that I wanna go over there and get on that bike, but can I plan my motor movements to do that? That's the middle piece. And the last piece is the motor execution of, of that, of getting on that bike and actually riding it. So often the sensory processing piece of it is that middle piece, is a motor planning piece that involves proprioception and planning their motor movements to do what they want it to do. The motor execution part of it is actually physically doing the act. And that's more in the, the physiotherapy, which we'll talk about in a minute. So how do we work on those sensory skills to make them better? And that is through uh, working with the child using different tools and equipment. So for example, that riding example, we might put a heavy backpack on their back so they feel their body more. We might put ankle weights on their feet so they're more planted on the pedals. So those types of things, we're gonna over-exaggerate um, what's happening so that that child gets more feedback of where their body is in space. So using weight is a big one for that. Um, so that's just a little example. The other thing that uh, OTs do is provide sensory diets or and that's a, another misnomer. It's not an actual physical eating diet. It's a diet of a sensory break. So we want to prescribe sensory breaks in the schools for this child who's having difficulties getting through an entire day at school um, because of their sensory needs. They need those mats. So they do have to retreat two to three times in the day to get their sensory needs meet so that they can go back in the classroom and be more attentive. So that we do uh, and provide lots of strategies to caregivers to schools for that. The other big piece post COVID um, that has come up is dealing with focus and attention um, issues and providing strategies to the child. Um, these strategies go lifelong because if this isn't a difficult thing for a child um, at this point, more than likely they're gonna struggle with it as they go through life. And these strategies can be um, used throughout life. Um, so that OT is gonna figure out what works best for this child in particular to help them attend and focus. As I said before, very individualized. We want to uh, trial many different strategies and tools to make sure we got the right one for that child. 
Um, and that's the beauty of private is we can do that um, with the tools that we have right there. Um, then the fine motor development is another big piece for occupational therapies, therapists. Um, many of these got kind of on the back burner during COVID, handwriting ability, being able to ma manipulate fasteners on their clothes. Um, those things all got a little bit uh, behind. So occupational therapy can work on those skills, bring them up to where they should be and at age appropriate levels. Any questions about occupational therapy at this point? Okay. Okay. Physiotherapy. Most people know what physiotherapists do. Um, most know more so on the adult side, but for children, yes, we do see kids with physical disabilities. I would say though, it's more um, less with that and more with things like gross motor development period. Is that child where they need to be at the age they are um, and providing treatment um, to increase and bring them up to their developmental level. Um, we look at motor planning, and this is that what I was explaining about the bike example. They work more in that last motor execution piece of the, the activity. So they want to look and see whether that core um, stability is there because we know we can't really work on extremities if our core is not where we should be. So often kids who have a lot of fine motor um, trouble, we want to make sure that core is developed before we even work on the fine motor. Um, so that's what the physios do. They will assess and see if there's weakness anywhere. Is there low tone? Um, where are those kids struggling? And some things they find too is even just they haven't developed, um, kids miss certain things in their development, such as reciprocal crawling, for example. Uh, if they don't do that in their um, development in that time, that sometimes they, they have difficulties with bilateral coordination, bringing those two sides of the body together. So we might have to actually go back and look at the skills that they didn't um, hone at that time in their development and get them where they should be. So it's built on a firm foundation of skills. Okay, physio. Now we wanna go to speech and language. Another one, most people do know what speech and language pathologists do. With children, they focus more in articulation and language. And uh, I would say definitely we saw some, some lack in the language just because of peer interaction um, and uh, pragmatics. So a, a speech and language looks at pragmatics and they look at, does that child even get that joke that somebody said on the playground? Um, it, it, it can be a language processing issue. So that's speech and language. And then we look at psychotherapy, um, helping these kids. Uh, the gold standard right now is the cognitive behavioral therapy for, for anxiety. It seems to work really, really well. That child has to be fairly um, high level cognitively, and they have to be um, at a certain age to really understand the strategies um, that they work on with CBT. But that is definitely a gold standard. And if they're younger, we use a lot of play therapy, just getting on the floor with them, uh, doing certain games and, and working out things as you're interacting with them. Um, DBT is, is something that we've started, is dialectical behavior therapy. And that is used more with behavioral concerns as well as mood disorders. So for depression, um, those are, those are um, I'm not a uh, psychotherapist, so I will just tell you, I'm not exactly um, versed in all of this, but I do know they use all these different models and strategies with the, with the kids. Um, another big area that's, that has happened uh, with us being so close together during pandemic, there's been strains on just caregiver child relationships. 
Um, so we have a lot of uh, family sessions that are going on with the psychotherapist, sibling sessions sometimes, um, but just trying to foster that relationship back to where it should be. So they've done an, an awful lot of that lately. Okay, last uh, service that we deal with is our psychology. So what we've seen is some of the learning has um, been a bit delayed. Also things haven't been caught such as, um, uh, uh, I'm losing my words, graphesthesia, that kind of thing, um, reversals of forms um, aren't being picked up. So testing, is something that really needs to be done with a psychologist with psychoeducational testing. So they are looking for any learning challenges. Uh, they can diagnose autism, ADHD, other mental health uh, diagnoses. And as we said before, the caregiver became more aware of any on, um, challenges when they were online learning and they know that something is happening there. What is, is there a processing issue? That is something that the psychologist can figure out for them and do the testing uh, to identify where the areas of weakness are and make a diagnosis if appropriate. Um, the other thing we've, we've started doing is just having the psychologist available for consultation with the caregiver, navigating with, the school relationship is a really important piece. Um, some parents are at odds with the school and need someone to help advocate for them. And that is where the psychologist can come in and help them build what we call an IEP, which is the school's responsibility. Um, they take in all take into consideration all the um, identified areas that the psychologist might have rose and build an individual education plan within the school. So the psychologist can really help build that IEP plan and offer suggestions and also help um, the school incorporate all those strategies and suggestions too. All of our actual, um, all of our services have a bit of a hand in that too. Uh, for example, in the in occupational therapy, we can help the school implement a sensory plan for the child, uh, as well as physio plan and a speech plan. But uh, the psychologists are really quite good with the academic piece um, of how to put those things in place. Okay. Now, I'm just going to let you know how you can access uh, private therapy. And uh, right now, uh, there's no doctor's referral needed. That would be only if uh, a per person's insurance company uh, asks for that. So depending on um, the, the insurance company that's involved, they may or may not need a doctor's referral. But right now, uh, a parent or a caregiver could call and start the ball rolling. We do do get, we do get um, a fair amount of family doctor referrals and pediatrician referrals. So they can come directly from them too. Uh, parents may phone and say, I was recommended by my family physician to reach out, that's fine too. Um, so a lot of them just call the office, which is there. They can email. Um, we have an info at childrenstherapy.ca there available, as well as going on our website, which I would really encourage because it outlines all our services there. And that's childrenstherapy.ca. There's a way of sending an email through our website asking for a referral. Um, once someone has um, got their account uh, set up on our website, they can actually book online as well. So that those are all options. Um, we have a presence on social media. That's always there too. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we have all those accounts. So I feel like I have talked and talked and talked. <laughs> and um, 
that I just want to know if there's any questions about any of our services we offer, anything about the effect of the pandemic on the children's um, development or anything else. We'll leave it open. So if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I this is Ken. Um, I was uh, listening to someone, I think they were interviewing the author of a book called Of Boys and Men. Mm -hmm. And they were, I guess the author is trying to explain why there's so much uh, sense of alienation in society, why um, it, it's men mostly that perpetrate a lot of the violence, not just violence against women, but uh, mass shootings and mm -hmm. a lot of the political polarization, especially racism, uh, you know, against gender, identities mm -hmm. but um one of the things he talked about was the fact that girls go through puberty earlier than mm -hmm. boys mm -hmm. and so they tend to be more advanced in the crucial high school years where they they do better in school and uh i mean you know mm -hmm. a large shift now to women having far more education than men and including in the professions you know like most medical schools have a predominance of women mm -hmm. but uh, just talking about the um the disengagement that can start in school and early on right by the stress of not feeling that they can perform or um well it came to mind when you were talking about the isolation in the home for a couple of years and then going back to school and having all these new social stresses that they haven't learned how to engage in a group with other children or they didn't realize that there were other kids who were more skilled or knowledgeable than them and so they're starting to feel inadequate or isolated. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not sure what my question is, but <laughs> it it just this came to mind as you were talking, and I I was mm -hmm. just wondering if you had comments on that kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one thing in just your your uh, and it it is true there is a difference between how the female matures and how the male matures. And there are like our testing has norms set up for females and and males. So we're hoping we're matching maturation level of where they should be for their gender. Um, so that's there. Developmental level true is um, the earlier the intervention, the better. So early intervention is always always the the key. Um, trying to work on skills that have been this way for a very, very long time, it's hard to go back. That is where we incorporate just strategies, basically not trying to fix the problem because they're so ingrained. Um, I would say too, learning styles is a really important piece to identify. And that would be through our psychological testing is figuring out how best to teach this child. So what is their, you know, school is very, very much visual and auditory. And if you don't fit that, you are going to struggle and you're not going to like school. And that turns them off right away. But if we can find the right way to teach them and to teach the education, um, the teachers and that sort of thing is how to work with these children who have different learning styles. Um, many of them are the hands-on. Um, the other day, uh, I had a child that just, he sat down and all he wanted to do was touch every single thing on my table. So because he was so distracted with tactile, he could not concentrate and focus. So I put a fidget toy in his hand 
and it directly improved his ability to focus and attend. So if that is a simple little strategy we put into place, these are these are the kind of kids, and especially I will say the, the boys in particular need this um, identification of, of uh, tools, strategies, something to make their life easier in the classroom because there's no other option. They need their schooling. So how do we make that a pleasant experience so that they can um, they can progress in their skill and be good achievers in a different way, but good achievers, um, the same as, as the females. So that's my comment, I guess. <laughs> Hello. Yes. I have uh, just continuing along these uh, comments from Ken. This is Ola. Okay. Uh, um, these uh, gender, the, the difference in learning patterns and between girls and boys, it's mm -hmm. always there. I remember primary school and early secondary school, the girls were a little bit smarter. And then why is it that that difference did not come at that time we were growing up with all this violence perpetrated by men, especially young men against women and other mi and minorities, Mm -hmm. different kinds, what changed along yep. the decades? Yeah, that's a, that's a million dollar question. That is out of my scope for sure. Um, why are men turning to violence? I think there's a whole other uh, kettle of fish there around uh, their exposure in the media and what they're being fed in um, well, social media, but also just in their screens, in their viewing. Um, I have probably in, in my 36 years, uh, you know, when I first started practicing, screens were not, were not even there. <laughs> and now I find them almost the biggest influence in a, in a child. That's my own personal feeling. Uh, others may feel differently, but um, that and the parenting, parent coaching has been another uh, huge uh, blossoming of work there that we, we didn't really need to do before. Um, so that's, that's another area, but I don't have the answer to that. And uh, I, you're, you're right, it is definitely being identified more and more. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Go okay. ahead, Ola. I think in the absence of any other questions, uh, we have to thank you for this um, excellent presentation that oh, brought me into a world that I really, on a work-based level, encounter. And I really appreciated how you put together so many webs, um, telling, letting us know what the different uh, professionals do in different areas. Thank you very much. The, oh, you're you're very the, welcome. And the Paris Sound uh, Medical Society and the West Paris Sound Health Center. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your words. That's it's great to feel the support here since we've arrived. Everyone has been extremely supportive in our services. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other last minute questions, comments? Hearing none, seeing none. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, as uh, Dr. Kassam indicated, we've all learned a lot about the different disciplines and what uh, uh, your organization can offer to the Perry Sound residents. So thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. Yeah. And just a reminder, our last set of rounds for 2022 will be December 16th, and it will be Dr. Carolyn Baer, who will be presenting on heart failure.